abroad, not seeking counsel, but to share my narrative with others and receive reflections on whether I may have crossed a line. To maintain confidentiality, I'll refer to my spouse as Elena, and myself as Ernest. Our paths intersected at a city bar one evening when she was 23 and I was 25. While discovering love in bars typically poses a considerable risk, this encounter felt distinct. In hindsight, perhaps it wasn't. She was accompanied by a group of friends, while I was with my brother and his acquaintance. Amidst the lively music of a band, my brother and his companions engaged with a few girls from their circle, leaving her and me in conversation. Struck by the noise, we migrated outside, where we spent the majority of the night acquainting ourselves. As dawn approached, we exchanged contact information, and the following morning, she messaged me expressing her enjoyment of our conversation and inquired about my plans for the day. The truth is, I didn't have anything planned but told her I was going to go for a run and then take a bike ride just to impress her. She texted back and said that sounded fun and that she loved biking and asked me where I was going. I told her to a local bike trail where I rode occasionally. She asked when I was going, and I made up the time. She texted and asked if she could join me. I was pleasantly surprised at her boldness and told her sure, and that's how our relationship started. She met me at the trail, and we biked a couple of hours. When we finished, we went to a restaurant near the park for Saturday happy hour and ended up staying for dinner. We actually didn't leave until they closed at 10. We both knew this was a case of love, or at least lust, at first sight. A couple of dates later, things happened between us, and our relationship moved quickly. After that, we moved in together after 11 months and married a year later. I know that I moved a little too fast, but things were really good between us back then, and our families encouraged us to tie the knot. Everything about our marriage was great, with the exception of a very dark patch we went through in our third year together. It was then that my wife, who at the time was six months pregnant, lost the baby. We were both devastated by the loss. For the first few weeks after, we supported each other, and the loss actually brought us even closer together. Then there was a point where she suddenly became distant and downright hostile to me. This all started after she went back to work and lasted over three months. I chalked it up to depression and asked her multiple times to see a counselor or talk to her doctor, but she refused. Throughout this time, I was very patient and supportive of her, but it was very difficult. She constantly criticized me and got emotional over the littlest thing, and several times, she up and left the house for hours out of frustration. She refused all intimacy and was withdrawn. Spending most of her time texting back and forth with friends and her mother, or so I thought. Both our families noticed it too and asked her to seek help, but she refused and told them to mind their business. Things got so bad that I reached a breaking point. I had a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with her and told her if she didn't change, I was leaving. She apologized and asked me to stay, swearing she would try harder and equated everything to losing the baby. During the weeks that followed, she was better, the arguing stopped. But she was still distant, and we had limited intimate encounters telling me it just didn't feel right or it was too soon. Then, out of nowhere, I got home one night, and she had a dinner waiting for me, complete with flowers and wine. She met me at the door and told me how sorry she was for. How she'd been acting, she told me that earlier that day while she was working, everything hit her like a ton of bricks. She said, at that moment, she realized how terrible she had been to me and became so upset she took the afternoon off to prepare dinner for us. From that day forward, my wife became more loving and affectionate than she had ever been. She has treated me like a king since then. Fast forward 90 days, and she became pregnant again. This pregnancy was successful, and she gave birth to our son. I now had what I thought was the ideal marriage, a loving wife, a beautiful child, great families, great friends, great jobs, and a nice home. Life was indeed good. That all lasted until one fateful Saturday morning two years ago. Earlier in the week, I had bought my wife a new tablet for her birthday, as her old one was over seven years old and was no longer supported by the manufacturer. While her old tablet was no longer supported, I could still use it for streaming. I thought I would put it in the garage on my work credenza and use it to listen to podcasts and satellite radio while I'm working out there. I looked around for her tablet and finally found it at the bottom of her underwear drawer. Strange place to put it, but I didn't realize why at the time. I took it out to the garage and powered it up, and when I did, a messenger application came up. She was still signed in, and I could tell from the message dates she hadn't used the app for nearly three years. I was about to minimize the application, 
but then decided to snoop a little and open one of the messages. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was a message between her and her then boss. In the message, she was explaining to him why they could no longer be together. She said what she had done was wrong, and she suddenly realized it that day. I then went back and found hundreds of messages between the two of them. The messages span a three-month period that coincided with the time she was treating me so poorly. It all made sense now. She was having an affair with her boss that entire time. This guy and I sat together at company outings and golfed together several times during and after their affair. He has a wife and a son just a year older than our boy. I was furious. What infuriated me even more was the conversations between the two of them where they openly mocked me and his wife, and worst of all, where they bragged about what they did with us after their encounters. It was soul-crushing. I was devastated at first, but then just got angry. I thank God she wasn't home right then, as I don't know what I would have done had she been. I read each message in detail until she called me on her way home. Before she got there, I took the tablet out to my car to hide it from her and to make sure I still had access to the messenger app for evidence. When she got back, I helped her put away the groceries and then told her I needed to go into the office for a couple of hours, as I had forgotten something at the office. I synced up the tablet to a personal printer I had there and printed off their conversations, all 972 of them. While printing them out, I grew progressively angrier and contemplated my next move. When I left the office, I was full of rage and headed over to her boss's house. My plan was to go there and deck him. When I got on his street, I came to my senses and decided that was not a smart thing to do. Instead, I headed home to confront my wife. I was even more full of rage, but again, sanity kicked in and I decided against it. Instead, I went to the park near our house and walked for over an hour, devising a plan. Amazing how fresh air clears the mind. The one thing I knew was that I would be divorcing her, nothing she could say could ever justify what she had done. I wanted to ambush her and humiliate her with a divorce to make her feel as bad or worse than I felt when I found out about her affair. I also wanted her to suffer. I thought, you know, until I serve her with divorce papers, I'm going to treat her the same way she treated me when she was having the affair. And that's exactly what I did starting that Monday evening. During the day, I met with two different attorneys and picked one with a reputation for being ruthless to handle my divorce. I presented the attorney with all the messages and the tablet computer. According to her, this was more than enough to justify an at-fault ruling, as the messages included many graphic pics of the two of them, including several they took together. What it took and sent those pics, who knows, but I'm glad they did, as my attorney said without them, the infidelity would be more difficult to prove. The toughest part was waiting, my attorney said she would need a full three weeks to drop the papers due to a backlog. I then contemplated how I would handle things with my wife. I couldn't stand the sight of her but knew I had to play it cool until the papers were ready. Also, I had my two-year-old son to think about, I wanted to make sure everything was good for him. As I said, I decided to treat my wife the same way she treated me during her affair. I refused all of her advances, acted distant, criticized her, and started arguments over ridiculous things. I know some are going to say I should have been the bigger person and not stoop to her level, to them, I say I didn't cheat, so I'm not stooping to her level. I'm just giving her a little taste of her own medicine. She noticed the change right away and did everything to please me. Even though she was doing everything right and had been since the end of her affair, I treated her like garbage. Thankfully, I only had to keep up this act for a little over two weeks, as my attorney completed the paperwork faster than she originally thought. I then had to decide the best way to confront her. I decided to do it on a Sunday morning when both sets of our parents would be at the house. They normally come over right after mass and have coffee and breakfast with us. My plan was to print out copies for them and ask them to read it, then hand a copy to my wife. After she realizes what it is, I would then present her with the divorce papers right in front of our parents. I know to many of you, this is going to seem like a petty and childish way of handling the situation, but until you've been cheated on and disrespected like Elena had done to me, you can't imagine the hurt and pain. To make the confrontation even more dramatic, the night before, I took her out to an expensive dinner, bought her flowers, and we spent our first romantic night together in two weeks. Saturday came, and I arranged to have my sister-in-law pick up our son and take him to her house, where he would stay overnight, and I would pick him up on Sunday afternoon. My wife absolutely loved the evening we spent together, and I could tell she felt a sense of relief after the way I had been acting during the previous two weeks. 
she told me how worried she had been about me. I felt guilty for a minute there, but then the pictures of her and her boss flashed through my mind, along with the awful things they had said about me and the things she did to me after their encounters. That guilt quickly left my mind. Sunday morning came, and I thought long and hard about backing out of the plan right up to the last minute, but in the end, I went forward with it. Our parents arrived and brought bagels, and we had coffee and juice ready, like we normally do. We all sat around for 45 minutes or so, talking and laughing. I then excused myself from the table and said I had something to show. My wife looked at me puzzled when I went to retrieve copies of the messages and photos. My hands were shaking, and my heart was pounding. I took the copies to the bathroom, stared at the mirror, and again contemplated backing out. But thinking about the messages and pictures again motivated me forward. I presented the copies to each of our parents and told them to read the messages and look at the photos. My wife gave me a look and asked, What is it? I just smiled and lifted my index finger, motioning for her to wait a minute. Our parents had a look of shock on their faces and didn't say anything until my dad raised his head, looked at me and my wife, and asked, What is this? With that, I handed my wife a copy. She started looking through it and immediately started crying. She went to get up from the table, I told her to wait a second and handed her the divorce agreement. She dropped the paperwork and ran upstairs. I spent the next 15 minutes explaining to our parents in detail about the situation. Our mothers and my father-in-law had tears welling up in their eyes, while my dad was just disgusted. I told my in-laws that I wanted them to take Elena to their house until we can work out a separation agreement leading up to the divorce. They agreed, and my mother-in-law went to our bedroom to talk to Elena. After 90 minutes of sobbing, Elena left with her. Parents without a scene. I think she was in shock, she had a blank stare on her face, and her eyes were raw from tears. The only thing she said to me when she left was that she was sorry and she loved me. I told her we'd talk tomorrow. She ran over to hug me, and I hugged her back, as I didn't want to be confrontational at that point. I just wanted her gone. The following day, she texted and called me repeatedly, but I didn't respond until the evening. I called her and let her talk, which she did for over 20 minutes without stopping. She just kept apologizing, telling me how long ago it was, and that she thinks the shock of losing the baby made her do it. I listened, and when she finished, I just asked if she had read through the divorce papers. She said no and then started crying and begging me not to divorce her. I told her that was her only option and that I'd like to make it as painless as possible for both of us and for our son. She just kept begging and crying, and eventually, I politely ended the call, as there was nothing coming from her end except sobbing. The next day at work, I got a call from her dad. He said they had taken Elena to the hospital, as she was acting irrationally and threatening harm to herself. I told her dad I was sorry to hear that and wished her well, but I said I would not be visiting her. I called my attorney and informed her of the situation. She became angry as she warned me about handling the confrontation as I did. She said now things are likely to get complicated well. That it surely did. The laner remained in the hospital for five days and then was put into an intensive regimen of outpatient therapy. After she got home, her parents said the doctors believed she has dissociative identity disorder, also known as having multiple personalities. They told me the doctor said she may have been a different person mentally during the affair, and that's why she did it. I did some reading up on this condition, and there is no decisive testing that confirms this, it's just something doctors conclude looking at a person's behaviors, their medical history, and through observation. I didn't buy it. I thought it was just an excuse for bad behavior and something that could be used to her advantage in court. I called my attorney to let her know the news. She told me this was unfortunate as this will definitely complicate matters and may delay the process depending on how her attorneys decide to utilize the diagnosis. While she didn't normally do so, she recommended that I voluntarily offer up marriage counseling. She explained that after my ambush antics, this gesture would be looked upon favorably by the courts. So that evening, I went over to my in-law's home and visited my wife and took our son. We laughed and played for a while, and it felt like old times. I had my mother-in-law watch him for a while while I talked to Elena and told her I wanted to go to marriage counseling. She was overjoyed and hugged me. I played along, but again, I had no intentions of reconciling. I was only following the recommendation of my attorney. We went to six sessions, the counselor was a nice woman but I could tell her only goal was to keep us together, no matter what. My wife took all the blame and offered me anything I wanted to stay. 
the counselor explained that my wife experienced PTSD from a lost pregnancy, which caused the did. She tried to convince me that this was an anomaly and that my wife was a completely different person now. Even though I was still boiling with anger inside, I held it together and just told them I can't do it. I said I would never get the pictures of my wife and her boss out of my head, and I would never forgive her for what she did to me and our family. The counselor kept telling me to remember that it was not Elena, it was someone else, but I stayed firm and held my ground through multiple sessions of this. Eventually, the counselor gave in when she realized I wasn't going to change my mind. After much convincing, Elena eventually came to accept that I'd never get over the situation and it would be best if we just became great co-parents for our son. When we went to trial, my attorney worked out an agreement with Elena's attorney, and we had everything agreed to before going into the hearing, splitting her assets 50 to 50 and sharing custody of our son. We also agreed there would be no child support or alimony, as my wife had a good job, though she didn't earn as much as me. When we got into the courtroom, the judge pretty much put aside everything we agreed to and started from scratch. She okayed the 50 to 50 division of assets but started challenging the rest of what we worked out. Seeing where things were headed, my attorney asked for a recess, which the judge granted. She then explained to me that we would need to enter into evidence all the chat messages and photos, as well as discuss my wife's mental diagnosis in order to have any shot at getting 50 to 50 custody and no alimony. We didn't discuss this with my wife or her attorney beforehand, my attorney just presented it after hearing everything. The judge awarded 50 to 50 custody but specified that my wife's home would be the primary home. She did not require alimony but stated I would need to pay child support that would be reassessed on an annual basis. In the end, I guess things could have turned out worse, but I was baffled since we live in an at-fault state. I thought the divorce would be a simple process. My attorney explained that the divorce process is relatively straightforward in all counties except for those where the leadership and judiciary are more progressive. She said in those counties, it is a battle to get a fair deal for the husband, even when there's documented evidence of cheating. She explained that it depends on the judge and that I was lucky this judge was somewhat moderate. I didn't realize things worked like this, so after we sold our house and split the proceeds, I moved just over the border to a suburban county which has a more traditional value system. The drama with the divorce didn't end there, though. As it was now time to inform the AP's spouse, I wanted to do this right after I confronted my wife, but my attorney insisted I wait until after the divorce was final. I got her contact information off LinkedIn and called her. We met later that afternoon at a coffee shop in the lobby of the building where she works. I presented her with the evidence and told her what had occurred. Learning this information, she, of course, was upset. She apologized, thanked me and then ran out of the coffee shop crying. At that point, I felt everything was complete, and I could move on. But the drama didn't end there. A week later, I got a message from my wife's AP. He was obviously inebriated and ranted about how I ruined his life. He said I cost him his job, his wife, and his kid. He just mumbled on sporadically, making threats until the message timed out. He called back a total of seven times, leaving similar messages, which mostly were inaudible due to his condition. I texted him and told him to stop calling me, or I would go to the police. He sent me a message back, telling me to off. I'd had enough, so I went to the police station. I let them listen to the messages and got a temporary restraining order against him. The police also called him and told him to knock it off, which he did. To complicate things, he apparently called multiple people at my wife's office that same evening. He told them the reason he was fired is that he and my ex-wife had an affair. While Elena didn't lose her job over this, she became the topic of office gossip and the butt of many jokes. Things got so bad she eventually ended up quitting. While it felt good to see them both suffer financially, it wasn't a good thing for me as I was ordered to temporarily pay more in child support. My ex-wife eventually got a new job, and the amount was reduced. In the end, I got out pretty good with 50-50 custody, a small child support payment, and a tolerable co-parenting relationship with my ex. Overall, I'm proud of the way I handled things. However, my wife's family and many of our mutual friends are not. They feel I should have given her a second chance due to her mental condition. So, that brings me to my question, do you think I moved to divorce my wife too quickly considering her mental diagnosis? Remember, this is not something that can be determined by testing. It's just something her doctors concluded. To me, she cheated and disrespected me in the most egregious way possible, and that's all that matters.
regardless of which aspect of her personality is responsible, her state of heartbreak and remorse is evident. She longs to reunite with her family, but while I acknowledge her regret, the irreversible consequences of her actions prevent any chance of reconciliation from my side. My interactions with her will remain strictly professional, driven solely by the well-being of our son. I extend my best wishes for her future endeavors. This concludes my narrative. Regrettably, in certain instances, men encounter unjust treatment during divorce proceedings, even in jurisdictions where fault can be attributed, such as in cases of infidelity. Thank you once again for your attention. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you found the video enjoyable. Until next time, take care.